Okay, so today we're going to talk about trigonometric functions. And if you need to look for further explanation or additional examples, I would look in Chapter 1, Section 6. Now this will be probably one of our longer videos, so you might want a bag of, pop, a bag of popcorn, sit down with a piece of paper, and settle in. Now most of these topics we've talked about already in class, we're going to focus a little bit more on some of the new material with inverse trigonometric functions. Okay, so moving right along. So, um, we did not move. Here we go. Now we've moved. Radiance. Um, when we talk about the measurement of an angle in this course, we will be using radiance. So if you go between this course and physics, make sure you always change the mode. Now we know that if we have a unit circle, okay, that the measure of angle ACB at the center of this circle is equal to the length of the arc that ACB cuts from the unit circle. Now that's if we have a radius of 1. The arc length is equal to the measurement of theta. Now we don't always have a radius length of 1. So sometimes our radius length will be different. Now this relationship here will always hold true no matter what the radius is. Okay? So let's say we're given a radius of 6 units. So the radius is 6. And the radian measure is 3 pi over 2. So that is the measurement of the arc that is intercepted by the angle. And we want to find the measurement of that central angle. Okay? So we would divide by 6 or multiply by 1 6. So the center there. So then we get pi over 4 is the measurement then of that central angle. Now, using the unit circle, that is where we derive all of our functions, six trigonometric functions. And so here's the unit circle. Okay. And we know that with the central angle of theta, given a point P on the circle, using the relationships between x, y, and the radius, we will be able to define all of our six trigonometric functions. Now let's talk more about um, three of those trigonometric functions. Sine, cosine, and tangent, you're all pretty good at. But what about their reciprocal? So for example, y equals cosine. We know that the reciprocal is y equals secant x. Now I don't know if you have these memorized. I know sometimes I'll get a little foggy, so I have to make a quick sketch for myself. So I wanted to make sure you knew how to make a quick sketch. Knowing this is cosine, the reciprocal is we would take the y values then and take the reciprocal, of course. Now, three points here that I'm looking at are the zeros. Because we know the reciprocal of zero is undefined. So therefore, on my reciprocal function, that negative pi hat will be undefined. Positive pi hat. Notice we have asymptotes here. And then three pi hat. It would continue such. Whoa, I just went to the next page. Whoa. There we go. Okay. Now, another point that helps me in graphing, making a sketch of secant x, is this point here. Because you notice that this point here is 0, 1. So the reciprocal of 1 is 1. So at 0, then on the reciprocal, I would still have a point at 0, 1. Now, here we have pi, negative 1. Well, the reciprocal of negative 1 is negative 1. So at pi, it would be negative 1. Now, I know the basic idea of what secant does, but with these guides, I can now make a sketch of secant with a period of 2 pi. You should be able to do the same for sine and tangent. So you notice here's cosine with its inverse, and check out the domain and the range. Now, the domain is all real numbers for cosine, but for the reciprocal, we have to not include those values where the asymptotes are. Now you'll notice the range then is between 1 and negative 1, where on the reciprocal, it's everything greater than 1, and then everything less than negative 1. But the period remains the same. Now for sine, can you do the same thing? Can you find its reciprocal function and talk about the domain and range? And for tangent, can you find its reciprocal function and talk about the domain and range? This image is also in your book. Okay, periodic functions. Our trigonometric, trigonometric functions are periodic because we know that the cycle will repeat. Now, for cosine, sine, secant, and cosecant, we have a period of 2 pi. 
The unique ones are tangent and cotangent. They have a period of time. Even odd? Um, cosine is, if we look at this function, we notice that this is an even function. A couple of things we can show algebra uh, graphically is even because it is symmetric about the y-axis. And then algebraically, if I look at the input value here of pi, then the output is a negative one. Well, when I look at negative pi, the output is also negative one. So we notice that it has the same output for opposite inputs, therefore even. Now sine would be odd function because it is symmetric about the origin. And then on these, if we look here at pi half, it's 1, but at negative pi half, the output is negative 1, so they are odd. Okay, now let's talk about transformation. Now with transformation, with trigonometric functions, we've done a little bit of work. We know that this will relate to the y value of my graph, because it's outside of the parenthetical statement, and we know this will relate to the x value. Now let's rewrite it so we can better evaluate that horizontal shift. Negative 2 sine, so we're going to factor out the 4, or in other words, divide out of 4, so x plus pi 4. Okay. Now looking at the y value, the negative tells us we will rotate, reflect, a reflection, I'm sorry, about the x-axis. And then for, tr for trigonometric functions, the 2 will indicate that we have an amplitude of 2. So instead of going up 1, down 1, we're going to go up 2, down 2. Now for the x value, now remember with the horizontal shift, we're going to have a factor. We're going to multiply by the factor of 1, 4. Well, since this has a period of 2 pi, this will repeat itself every 2 pi. So then as a result, the period is 2 pi over 4, or pi half. Wow, so this graph will repeat itself every pi half. Now you may have seen this as defined as 2 pi over b will indicate the period for any given trigonometric function, where the value here is b. Okay, now the plus 1 fourth, that will tell us we are going to do a horizontal shift to the left pi fourth. You should be able to describe each number in a trigonometric function and do the transformation. Okay? Now, I'd like you to do this, but actually I can't have you submit it. Oh, let's just do it together. Okay, y equals sine. Let's rewrite it so that we can better identify that horizontal shift. So I'm going to factor out a negative 2, divide it out. So I'll get x minus, dividing out 2, pi half. Okay, there is no change on the y coordinates, just the x coordinates. So now I know I'm going to rotate around the y-axis. And this tells me then the, the 2 will be a horizontal shift of 1 half. So it's a factor of 1 half. But since we know that this has a period, we would do 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So the period will be pi. And then we will move right pi half. Now, with trigonometric functions, they can be a little tricky to graph. I usually start with five points of the original parent function. So sine starts at zero, and then it would end at zero. I'm going to go ahead and, and do the period of pi, so it's going to end at pi. And then I know the middle point must also be at zero. So my graph would look something like that. So I've taken account now for the period. Now let's talk about the rotation across the y-axis. So this will stay put. I will reflect each of these, I keep saying, I mean reflect, there we go. And now I have to take that whole thing and move it to the right pi half. Maddy, huh? So there is my new graph. Okay. Now, inverse trigonometric function. This is sometimes where we can get a little bit confused. This is not the reciprocal function. Remember, inverse functions are we, when we take the x and y coordinates and we interchange them. Okay? Also, we know we're going to be symmetric about the function y equals x. And we can verify that a function is inverse by doing composition. Now, 
If I look at my three basic trigonometric functions, you will notice that they are not one-to-one -one functions. So therefore, as they stand, they do not have an inverse function. But don't you worry, we can restrict the domain of these so that we can wrap their inverse function. Aren't you glad? So the domains and ranges of inverse functions become part of their definition. So for example, let's take a look at y equals cosine of x. Now let's just focus on the domain and range alone. Now, which piece of the cosine function will I look at? Now remember, it has to be a one-to-one -one function. So I'm going to start closest to the origin. So if I start here, if I look at this piece, that piece is a one-to-one -one, one -one function. So notice I'm going to restrict the domain. So the domain is going to go from zero to pi. Okay? So now if I talk about the domain and range of the inverse of cosine, we know that we interchange the domain and range of cosine. So the domain, so the domain of the inverse will go from negative 1 to 1, and the range then will be from 0 to pi. Sorry about that. So we can do that with all of our graphs. So if you ever forget about the restrictions on domain or range, just draw the original parent function, like sine, look closest to the origin, and we see here we have the piece that would represent the restricted domain. So we're going to go from negative pi half to pi half. Okay, tangent works the same way. So when I look at tangent, um, closest to the origin, we have this piece. So we're going to restrict from negative, whoops, sorry, I forgot to switch to negative, negative pi half to pi half. Okay, now just to make sure you got these written down, let me slide this down so you can see. These are the restrictions for domain and range of our inverse function. That's half the battle with inverse. Now, how do you graph the inverse? Let's continue. Okay, now this is the graph of the inverse function of cosine. Now we know that the graph of cosine of x looks something like this. So 2 pi, start at 0, so that pi, and here, here, here we go. Okay, now the inverse of cosine, then we are going to take the x and y values, and remember we interchange them. So 0, 1 is the first point, and then at pi, we notice it's negative 1, and then at 2 pi, we have 1, okay, and then there's some pi halves in between, right? But because we have to restrict cosine to just this piece right here, I'm only concerned with between 0 to pi. Now, because I'm interchanging the x and y, you'll notice on my graph now, the x-axis is in units, negative 1, 0, 1, and we notice the y-axis is in radians, okay? And looking here more closely, 0, 1 now becomes 1, 0 on the inverse. So hence I get to the point 1, 0. And we are here, this point was pi half 0. Now I'm going to have 0, pi half. There we go. Okay? And whereas this was pi negative 1, now negative 1, pi. And now you have a sketch of the inverse of cosine. You can do that for each one of these graphs. You can find the restriction on the domain and range, and then interchange the x and y coordinates. Now, this image here is in your book, so you can see the graphs of all the inverse functions. To be honest with you, though, I really, really only need you to be familiar with cosine, sine, and tangent inverse. Okay? Now, I'm going to pause the video here. Don't worry, there's a second part. We're actually going to do some functions, but I've run out of time. So this was part one. Let me stop my recorder.